Thanks. So thank you to Matt Pryor. And also thank you so much, Lamont Key, for just helping to arrange this uh, visit and for your hospitality. It, it means a lot to me, and I really appreciate it. So, and thank you all for carving time out of your schedules uh, to come be in community with me. Um, even though I'm a UA alum, um, I think we could still be friends, hopefully. So um, my talk today is uh, uh, okay, language and the locations of culture. Um, that's actually the, uh, so the talk itself is based on my last book, this one, uh, Locating Translingualism. But language and the locations of culture was the ti one of the titles I proposed uh, in the earlier iteration of the project that I wanted to go with, but um, ultimately it was shot down. Uh, so, uh, and so we ended up going with uh, locating uh, translingualism. Um, so the the <clears throat> so the the book itself and the talk today is based on a um, a question of uh, what can encounters with Korea across global space in their translanguaged form tell us about our intuited assumptions of what Korea is as a linguistically and culturally discrete identity e entity. So uh, what happens when we take this thing known as Korea, or it doesn't have to be Korea, I just happen to use Korea because that's just what I happen to be more familiar with, but when they move across, when um, iterations of that move across global space as uh, language forms associated with Korea come to be uh, blended and hybridized with other language resources. What does that tell us about that original thing that we thought to be Korea in the first place? Um, so um, I, <clears throat> my, I want to say my main offering in the project is what I call, uh, or not my main offering, but one, the, 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 the thing that I, I guess, focus on or the, the sites that I draw my attention to as, I think, significant spaces where we could really understand the and view the um, uh, what translingualism is actually doing to our understandings of language and culture in the real world. Uh, these are spaces that I refer to as semiotic um, uh, precarity, so spaces in which there's a typo, in which the quotidian and unremarkable specificities of cultural difference are either uncertain or call into question and as a result come to be both remarkable in the sense of literally being worthy of remark and as uh, semiotically distinct. So uh, spaces where it becomes necessary uh, to advertise or declare what, uh, what is unique about a given cultural entity. So things that kind of, spaces where um, things can't be taken for granted. So for instance, like uh, Denny's, like the, the diner, is an American diner, right? But you, wouldn't, you don't call it an American diner. You don't go out of your way to promote it as an American diner or this authentic American dining experience. It just is, right? It's just sitting there kind of boringly in the background, right? And, uh, but meanwhile, if you have a random Korean restaurant in the US, you have to overdo the Koreanness, right? You have to sell it as like authentically Korean, right? Because uh, um, you can't just call it a restaurant. No one's going to know to go there, right? Um, and other sites um, where, uh, uh, w that are characterized by semiotic precarity are also sites of tourism. So uh, tourist traps in Korea, um, people go there to experience like authentic Koreanness, right? The, this is not the uh, spaces of just like everyday, ordinary, mundane life, right? Like places, uh, tourist traps where, I should, not necessarily tourist traps, but tourist spaces, right? Where they're gonna spend that little extra effort to kind of sell an authentic an invented image of Koreanness, right? So uh, that is what I look at uh, in my, so I'm not gonna look at all this in this talk today, obviously, but the book itself is based on uh, visits to these different sites. So uh, lots of different sites of tourism and national memory in Korea. So that includes tourist sites, like so uh, popular tourist destinations or other sites of national memory, such as like museums uh, and things like that along with uh, 19 different Korea towns across Asia uh, and uh, other parts of the world. 
Um, these are the tourist sites in uh, Korea that I look at, along with the sites of national memory. These are just like kind of random uh, selection of historical sites or uh, sites where national memory is promoted or uh, other sites that are uh, like ritualized uh, places of, uh, of performing and doing national identity. Um, and then uh, these are the different Korea towns I've been to um, uh, for the purposes of this, uh, for, of this project. Um, it's not, um, I, so before I started this project, I had no idea there were this many Korea towns. And then I quickly learned through Wikipedia, like there's a lot, and there's a lot more that I, I uh, never, uh, or haven't yet visited, but, um, you know, we were talking earlier, I, I was uh, helping out with the grad student workshop this morning, and that was one of the questions that came up, like when do you know when to finish the project and get it out there? And yeah, for something like this, if I were to keep going to every single Korea, this book would never have come out, right? So you kind of got to just know like, okay, this is enough, uh, and I think there's enough here to do this project. Yeah. Um, so this is a kind of brief overview of the book itself. Uh, we could talk about the different chapters uh, later if we want, if, if there's interest. But the one I'm going to be focusing on is the fourth. Um, I, so the book itself, I, um, chapter four and five are my favorite. And I, so it's like, you know, the three case studies are language and culture, scaling culture, tracing culture. Um, and I was, you know, trying to pick between four and five for the purposes um, of today's talk, and I ended up focusing, uh, deciding to focus on uh, chapter four, which is on, on scale. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be um, reading a little bit and talking still, but um, 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 so I'll get, go ahead and uh, get started here uh, with diving into this, uh, the, <clears throat> the chapter on, on scale. Um, so, uh, scale is a challenging concept to define because of its sheer range of denotations. Uh, a scale as an object can refer to a series of small plates that cover the bodies of animals, such as snakes, fish, and of course, pangolins. Um, it can refer to a device used to determine the weight of an object based on a specific unit of measurement, or to compare the weight of two objects or masses as in a balancing scale. In music, Scale refers to a set of notes within a given pitch ordered according to ascent or descent. In cartography, a scaling refers to the ratio of the represented territory relative to the physical territory. In the business world, scalability refers to the ability to increase a given business model by proportionately building up its existing organizational components. Scaling can also refer to the practice of distributing attributes in a quantifiable manner, such as in the use of a Likert scale. And scaling can refer to the practice of describing or portraying objects or phenomena in relation to others in order to make them more comprehensible or relatable. With the exception of the zoological definition, so uh, I'm not talking about these kind of scales, right? Uh, what all these treatments of scale have in common is that they all concern measurement and relationality in some form or another, whether relations between similar objects, between those that are analogous, or are framed as analogous, or even those that are completely unrelated, but come to have a relationship via the work of scaling. Okay, so therefore, uh, for our purposes, uh, it's sufficient to define scale as a discursive framing device that enables us to orient or reorient ourselves toward a given element of our social worlds that is otherwise difficult or impossible to make sense of. Um, as Summerson Karn and Michael Lempert remind us, there are no ideologically neutral scales. Uh, Karn and Lempert thus outlined the importance of attending to what they term the pragmatics of scale. To quote, to take a critical distance from, a given, from given scalar distinctions, whether our own or others, and focus instead on the social circumstances, dynamics, and consequences of scale making as social practice and project. Um, the, <coughs> Okay, so the, oh wait. The COVID-19 pandemic offered among the most compelling lessons in the value of attending to the ideological work of scale. In the early months of the pandemic, in late uh, 2019, early 2020, uh, popular news articles with data comparing COVID-19 deaths 
to the annual flu deaths were being widely shared across social media by users in the US. One of the many examples was this one from USA Today, something far deadlier than the Wuhan coronavirus lurks near you right here in America. This is the early days when we were still referring to it as the Wuhan coronavirus. Um, uh, and there's another article published around that same time, that same month in BuzzFeed, uh, titled, Don't Worry About the Coronavirus, Worry About the Flu. Um, <clears throat> in early 2020, the strategy of downscaling COVID-19 in relation to the annual flu was used to emphasize that the emergent, pandemic, uh, emergent panic and fear around the novel virus was merely driven by anti-Chinese and anti-Asian sentiment. This was, as the argument went, yellow peril all over again. Interestingly, within a few months, the norm became upscaling COVID-19 by emphasizing its death rate relative to the flu, not just in terms of death tolls. Right? While the initial ideological priority of scaling COVID-19 was to foreground and problematize anti-Asian sentiment, by the time a virtual consensus had been reached by leading epidemiologists and public health officials, it could no longer be denied that COVID-19 was indeed a disease that needed to be taken seriously and not just something receiving inordinate media attention because it had originated in China. By late 2020, COVID-19 came to be scaled in relation to other tragic events in history with various infographics comparing the number of deaths to those of other historical moments, including various wars and the 9-11 terrorist attacks of 20, uh, 2001. Of course, the point in all this is not to simply underscore that uh, people got it wrong including those who initially argued that pan the panic uh, around COVID-19 was based uh, on uh, anti-Chinese fear-mongering, or those who continue to maintain that the virus was a hoax all along. There was and is something inherently unknowable about the pandemic, and therein lies the work of scale, to try and make something unknowable into something knowable. Scaling is at work all around us, which punctuates the need to, uh, to quote Karin Lempert again, track and narrate rather than capture and catalog the many ways that social life is scaled. Okay. So the element of social life that I want to focus on is uh, cultural distinction, the question of cultural distinction, in particular distinction via the register of the national and how it operates as an entailment of scalar work. Uh, indeed, the representability of nationness is not only a problem due to its contingency on ever-changing historical facts, but also due to the disconnect between the unremarkability of everyday life for typical national subjects and the frequently remarkable ways in which we learn and think about life in other nations. Consider, for instance, how world or global news is reported. We would not regularly hear about what is going on in Nation X unless the object were news were worthy enough to warrant the attention of an audience outside a given nation. I'm not trying to point out the obvious fact that our understanding of a other nation is always going to be inherently limited, but trying to make sense of the implications of representation via scalar work. More specifically, what does it mean that ideas of the nation are frequently circulated via visualizations that are almost invariably scaled? There's much that we can learn by attending to the ways in which national imaginaries are represented across global space via scalar work. In what follows, I will explore how the notion of Korea um, is scaled in accordance with various representational traits, or how it's uh, scaled in accordance with various representational traits, offers an important lesson on what Korea is, or at least what it is believed to be in a moment of encounter. Okay, so the first example of cultural scaling I want us to look at centers on the color red. Um, I look to how at the turn of the millennium, so early 2000s, uh, red uh, became, uh, came to be synonymous with Korea, largely by chance and how such fortuitous semiotic chromatism has since been embraced and deployed in a range of contexts to represent Koreanness. As many may remember, uh, arguably the most, uh, um, among the most prominent instances of global Koreanness in recent memory occurred during the 2002 FIFA World Cup, co-hosted by Korea and Japan. Uh, in Los Angeles, home of one of the largest Korea towns in the world, thousands of fans gathered at odd hours of the morning, owing to the 16-hour uh, time difference uh, between LA and uh, the host countries, to cheer for the Korean football team, which made a historic run to the semifinals, far exceeding uh, even the most idealistic of expectations. 
Dressed in red, the supporters of the Korean football team, known affectionately as the Red Devils, swarmed in the streets to, point, uh, to the point that it could be said that uh, LA approached a super saturation of Koreanness, as it were. So this picture is actually not from LA, this is from, uh, from Korea, but the streets of LA looked uh, just like this. Right? <clears throat> Uh, significantly, many supporters were not of Korean heritage, but by wearing red, were able to momentarily blend in and be effectively indistingu indistinguishable from an actual Korean, especially from an aerial or bird's eye view. Uh, images of massive crowds of red devils, not only in the Korea town of LA, but from actual stadiums in which the events took place, were widely circulated during the World Cup and have since come to be synonymous with uh, Korean national pride. This can be confirmed via, so if you just do a quick Google image search for Korean nationalism, you're going to see a lot of pictures like this. Um, one of the obvious reasons why the notion of Korea's red is so interesting is that red is not an exclusively Korean color. The color red, in fact, has been noted to serve a series, uh, a series of universal functions. Uh, Ron Scollin and Susie Wong Scollin described the functions of a prohibitory uh, red circle with a diagonal line and that of a stop sign in the form of a red hexagon or a red cross to denote medical support. Color plays an important role in Norma Mendoza Denton's ethnography of Northern California Latina youth gangs focusing on the inextricability of spoken linguistic features and other embodied cultural practices, Mendoza Denton shows how red, along with blue, is described as indexical of different kinds of gang affiliations and social positionings. And of course, global brands ranging from Coca-Cola to Nintendo to YouTube use a variant of red as central to their trademark each with its own specific color code. It is through the framework of scale that we can begin to assess the range of contradictions that emerge when attempting to maintain differentiation on semiotic grounds of something like color that when rescaled loses its distinctiveness. All right, so like, I mean, just to use this example, it's kind of a silly one, but uh, these, the, these hex codes, like they're unique to each brand and these, each of these companies spent millions of dollars like figuring out what their exact color is going to be. But if you were to look at them in isolation, they would all kind of look the same, right? Um, so to return to red in relation to the Korean national football team and the symbolic production of global Koreanness, there are a few significant, though frequently underexplored, points that are worth considering. The first is a symbolic association with global success and appeal within the sport of football that red signified in the early 2000s during Korea's improbable run in the World Cup. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, the most popular football club in the world was, some of us might know, um, Manchester United, right? <clears throat> um, Manchester, uh, so Manchester United of the uh, English Premier League, uh, also known for their iconic red uniforms. This uh, time period was the heyday of uh, several megastars, most notably David Beckham, right? And the 1999 Man U team is considered to be uh, one of the greatest football teams of all time. A part of the club's success off the pitch was fostered by global marketing endeavors, most notably in the adjustments to the club's iconic crest. So while the crest that was used on the club's kits from 1970 included text of the club's full official name, Manchester United Football Club, um, for the 1998 season, it adopted a new crest with simply Manchester United. According to uh, Leonard Nielsen, the, so this is like a scholar of uh, um, uh, football uh, kits and uh, crests. And, um, uh, so uh, he, according to him, uh, the new text represented an effort to make the brand more internationally viable and simpler to print. In other words, in 2002, red was indexical of global success in the world of football in a way that it hadn't been in previous years and is not today. <clears throat> and is not today um, and the Korean national team no doubt benefited from the semiotic salience of, re salience of red at the time. And of course, the nickname of the fans uh, of the Korean national team, the Red Devils, is coincidentally the same uh, as Man Yu's unofficial moniker. It is also interesting to approach the significance of red in relation to a few other points. 
Um, the first is the fact that the South Korean national flag, the uh, Taegukki, uh, features three colors, red, blue, and black, on a white background. The centerpiece of the flag is a two-toned uh, Taeguk in red and blue, symbolic of positive and negative energy, respectively. Meanwhile, the symbolism of the red on the football uniform is not clear. Uh, according to some historians, while the dominant claim is that the adoption of the red uh, is, uh, is that it's been speculated that it symbolizes strength and passion um, it, or, or, that it has, uh, or that it's representative of the clothing uh, of a king. Um, so in either case, uh, uh, historians note uh, that uh, when Nike became the official uniform supplier in 1996, red began to be used more prominently and deliberately both uh, to sustain the passion of the players and spectators alike, while also psychologically intimidating uh, opponents. Regardless of the original uh, symbolic intentionality of red, uh, there's no doubt that color has been fully embraced since, even deviating from the coloring scheme of the national flag. More specifically, while blue was always featured on each uh, of the Nike uniforms as an accent color uh, and on the crest itself, by the 2018 World Cup, blue was only used on the white away kit and just very minimally, you can barely see it right there. Um, and it was removed entirely from the red uh, home kit. Uh, in addition, while the national team emblem had been blue, white, and black since its introduction in the 2002 World Cup, the team went with an exclusively black and white crest in 2018. And finally, the latest crest un unveiled uh, in 2020 had removed blue altogether. Uh, semiotically anchoring the national team's brand identity within uh, the color red. So you see this gradual shift away from using blue and then by 2020, uh, no blue at all. <clears throat> uh, the emergence and embrace of red as symbolic of Korea uh, are, particularly, are particularly curious when considered in relation to the significance of red to other adjacent national imaginaries. Red, for one, uh, is frequently associated with Chineseness and is readily visible in Chinatowns, um, as seen in uh, Jackie Jalo's ethnography of the Chinatown in Washington, D.C. Uh, in China, red is associated with happiness and fortune and becomes associated with Chineseness outside of China. It is by far the most chromatically salient feature of San Francisco's uh, storied Chinatown as well. Uh, Further, as I've noted elsewhere alongside uh, Jackie Lowe, the deliberate and extensive use of red in the Chinatown of uh, Korea in an effort to commemorate cult cultural influences of Chinese-Korean uh, exchange, uh, such as uh, Korean-Chinese uh, food, while simultaneously attempting to draw conspicuous lines of distinction between Korea and China, and thereby, uh, uh, <clears throat> and thereby re semiotizing the space as traditionally and authentically uh, Chinese. Um, in Westminster, California, which borders the Korean district of Garden Grove, the epicenter of Little Saigon uh, is the Asian Garden Mall, which features liberal use of red, though, with, uh, uh, though also with substantial use of green. And in the context of football, um, um, <clears throat> historians have noted the contradiction of the now naturalized association of the national football team with red, given that for most Koreans, red is associated with the Communist Party of North Korea following the semiotic legacies of the Korean War and the Cold War. Indeed, when comparing the national flags of North Korea and South Korea, the former features much, uh, red much more prominently than the latter does, and the North Korean uh, national football team also has a predominantly red uniform. So the semiotic association of Korea with red affords a compelling lesson in the pragmatics of scale. Whether by chance or by design, since the turn of the millennium, Korea has become red, as it were, and not only in the realm of global sport, but also in other spaces of national identity branding. Uh, however, as I've demonstrated, there's nothing inherently Korean about red, though Korea serendipitously became associated with red in the early 2000s due an obvious part to the Korean national team's unexpected success in the 2002 uh, FIFA World Cup, but also due to pre-existing indexicality of red within the world of football. This is important because red is something that cannot be trademarked, 
although a shoe designer, uh, Christian Louboutin, you know, the, with the red shoe. Like, he did try to trademark it a few years back, actually. The, um, and the, uh, it, it, it got overturned. It, it didn't, was not successful. He tried to sue one of the other, uh, was it Vey Saint Laurent, one of the other designers uh, for using red. Um, so anyway, oh, so red cannot be trademarked. And the embrace of red as Korean is curious, given the fact that uh, red is in many ways more semiotically proximate to other uh, adjacent national imaginaries, such as China, North Korea, and of course, Japan. In the end, the semiotic outcomes of scalar work cannot be and are not meant to be one-to-one uh, -one representations of, uh, of the nation anyway but in spite of their representational limitations, are readily deployed in spaces of semiotic precarity while also revealing the paradoxes of any attempt to achieve semiotic distinctiveness as well. Okay. So uh, I now want to shift gears a bit um, and spend uh, some time uh, talking about uh, uh, time, okay. uh, time and scale in relation to one another. So. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Koryo uh, can be found in numerous sites of semiotic precarity, ranging from popular tourist de destinations of uh, Itaewon to New York to Fort Lee, New Jersey to Dallas, Texas. In these spaces, Koryo is perhaps uh, best understood as a semiotic chromo chronotope to adapt Mikhail Bakhtin's expression as symbols that bridge relations between time and space. The chronotope in Bakhtin's formulation was originally a concept introduced to, to foreground, quote, the intrinsic connectedness of temporal and spatial relationships uh, in literature. Um, in the context of, uh, this was in the context of literary genre analysis, but has since been applied more broadly by scholars across the humanities and social sciences. Uh, here, I adopt it in a manner similar to that of other sociolinguists, in, including uh, Manuel Gisemo, to underscore the value of attending to how time-space relations are mapped onto the semiotic artifacts of the built environment. Uh, this chronotope in question evokes the name of the Koryo dynasty, which ruled the Korean Peninsula uh, from 936 to 1392 uh, CE, so long time ago. Uh, while there is a clear attempt to signify the timeless and proto-national heritage of Korea, if signifying <coughs> uh, tradition is this objective in selecting uh, Koryo instead of uh, the more obvious choice of Korea, uh, Korean his, uh, history buffs might, uh, might wonder why uh, Shila, or uh, as in the Shila dynasty, which predates even the Koryo dynasty, uh, is not the default choice. Uh, of course, uh, this choice is, is quite common um, in global Korean signage, such as in uh, this one's from New York, a Korean barbecue and a bakery in Annandale, Virginia. Uh, one explanation for the preference of one dynastic appellative over the other is the oral proximity of Korea to Korea, facilitating a causal link uh, for many consumers unfamiliar with the history of the Korean Peninsula. It is similar enough that Many can infer that there is some cognate, denotative, or etym etymological relationship between the two. There is undoubtedly a degree of uncertainty in its, in, in its signification, and by being only partially legible as having relationality to Korea, Korea can be especially effective in that it encapsulates the unknowingness that makes the foreign alluring. Um, at the very least, consumers can infer that it is perhaps an alternative spelling of Korea, which is not altogether inaccurate. The etymological derivative of the Western label, such as Korea or Korea in Spanish or La Corée in uh, French, is indeed uh, based on uh, Korea. So the semiotic versatility of this word, in this sense, lies not only in its ability to bridge a temporal link to the distant and unknowable past, but also in its ability to to traverse the very boundaries of language. <clears throat> but also, as an exaggerated and proto-nationalistic symbol of Koreanness, uh, Koryo is encountered as an index of national authenticity that raises questions about the very possibility of authenticity in the first place. In the space of Itaewon, so this is like a, a popular tourist uh, destination, the authenticity of Koreanness produced by the Koryo ceramic store in this image is 
compromised by the adjacency of a sign for money exchange, a clear indication that locals do not frequent this region. Um, unless maybe they're trying to find a gift for someone or something like that. Uh, but this is going to not be like, uh, or every, this is not like going to Target, like an everyday thing, right? They're not going to be going here. Um, so the conspicuousness of Koreanness suggests that spaces like Itaewon are not so much Korean as they are spaces for visitors to experience and even consume, and in this case, purchase Koreanness. Uh, the semiotic aggregate of this space, including the Koryo label and the abundance of traditional ceramics on display, are in many ways an instantiation of uh, the commodification of authenticity as described by Monica Heller. Uh, however, what is additionally noteworthy are the mechanics of scale and culture in spaces of semiotic precarity such as these. In this case, specifically in places that are uh, simultaneously um, foreign and local. So the case of, uh, so um, the, in the case of the uh, Koryo ceramics um, is intriguing for the reason that for a Korean person who resides in Itaewon or another tourist destination, um, authentic Korean commodities are likely uh, everyday and uninteresting uh, objects. Meanwhile, the encounter with uh, Koryo Kalbi in Dallas, Texas, uh, at, that I mentioned a moment ago, is noteworthy because of an almost identical effort to index authenticity. The sign for Koryo Kalbi, uh, Kalbi with its brush script stylization, along with its an the ancient aesthetic of the lamps, creates a mythic timelessness of Koreanness, but also calls attention to, the, to an anachronistic irony that the Korean barbecue served inside likely did not exist during the days of the Koryo dynasty. The irony is exacerbated by the production of the sign on a plastic sheet with vinyl decals backlit by fluorescent bulbs, along with an adjacent blue and red neon sign and the notification mandated by the fire marshal. This door remains open during business hours. It serves as a stark reminder that any attempt uh, at the reinvention of uh, nationness, whether via scale or work or by other means, is always contending with the rules and regulatory guidelines of modernity. In this case, literally the rules and regulatory guidelines of local muni municipal apparatuses. The, the Koryo chronotope within the space of Dallas becomes even more interesting when read in relation to nearly identical signage for uh, Koryo Korean barbecue found in Oakland's Koreatown. In a culturally diverse place like Northern California's Bay Area, comprised of demographically diverse cities such as San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland, it is perhaps by no means unexpected to find a thriving transnational Korean community. <clears throat> Yet, it becomes somewhat more unexpected to find such a phenomenon in the heart of the U.S. Southwest. This is, of course, not to suggest that cities such as Dallas are not ethnically diverse. I'm simply making the point that in cities uh, of the U.S. Southwest, unlike those in coastal regions, have not experienced the same demographic shifts resulting in, uh, from large-scale trans-Pacific migrations between U.S. and Asia. So upon encountering the sign for Koryo Kalbi in Dallas, one is struck by finding a sign evocative of a 700-year-old Korean heritage in Texas. The strangeness of the encounter reflects the discursive and semiotic climate in which the reinvention of Koreanness is tasked with. The production of Koreanness is at odds with, and thus must contend with, a strong local regional semiosis, which, although uh, by no means homogeneous, is nonetheless characterized by a constellation of symbolic associations with this uh, particular place. Um, what I mean is when one thinks of Texas, the possibility of a thriving Koreatown is not the first thing that comes to uh, your mind, right? It's other, um, there, because there's an immediacy of other stereotypical uh, cultural iconography, you know, like longhorn cattles, cowboy boots, all that stuff, uh, through which non-Texans are going to use to hastily imagine and construct the region. These are, to state the obvious, not representative of how people in Texas are, but operate as caricatural symbols that accompany imaginations of the region. Right, so in short, Koryo is a scalar rendition of Korea in a semiotic ecology in which there is a wide repertoire of highly salient scalar tokens already at play. But more generally, outside of the Korean nation state and outside designated tourist traps within the Korean nation state, there is always already an assumed lack of Koreanness that precedes the semiotic production of Koreanness. So this is uh, what I was referring to as semiotic precarity. 
and it allows us to learn how the notion of an authentic and traditional Kriya can be subject to reinvention uh, via scalar work. The outcomes of chronotopic scaling described here are in many ways reminiscent of a point made by Frederick Jameson regarding the limitations to accessing the past in its actuality uh, in an era when cultural production in the form of pastiche is the norm, where we have nothing to rely on but, quote, our own pop images and stereotypes about that past. However, even if the past is forever out of reach, the point is not simply to expose the anachronism undergirding these instances of semiosis. Patrons of Koryo Kalbi in Dallas do not go there thinking they are getting authentic ancient Korean barbecue. They are therefore effective and not only engineered but arguably ingenious scalings of Korea. If anything, they remind us of the role of temporal links that are attempted and emerge in the effort to semiotically scale a given cultural entity. In short, it doesn't matter whether they are authentic or not. What matters is the extent to which we accept and enable them to stand in for the nation in a given space of semiotic precarity. Uh, so to conclude, um, I asked the question, um, is it possible to see culture? And is it possible to see uh, the nation? Right? Uh, beyond symbols of the nation, such as national flags, which are visible almost everywhere, uh, almost anywhere, I've tried to show that the mechanics of seeing the nation and by extension seeing culture can be made sense of through the work of scale. In short, it is through the work of scale that we can see culture and as a result of such seeing begin to understand what semiotic traits have been in circulation across global contexts and have come to be naturalized as representative of the nation as a discrete entity, transposable to other national entities. What my case studies collectively point to is how the notion of Korea as a represent, rep, rep, representable entity is contingent on scalar work. From this vantage point, I would like to suggest that we are put in a position to not only revisit the various ways in which we semiotically encounter the nation, but also to reconsider the extent to which seeing images of the nation is different from seeing the, uh, seeing the nation itself. So on the one hand, one is almost always seeing a nation. Um, for instance, while driving on an ordinary road in a town that is part of a given nation. But such encounters were, will rarely reg, ever register as emblematic of the nation or as significant. And since driving on an ordinary road cannot be what renders one national experience distinct from that of another, we can start paying a closer attention to the various emblems that are deployed as representative of a given nation and exploring how distinctive such emblems are. And in so doing, that might in turn tell us how distinctive their uh, represent respective uh, national imaginaries are. Okay. Uh, thank you.